Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for showing up on, uh, in such nice numbers on a Friday afternoon before uh, Easter. Um, did you know we were going to pour wine? <laughs> you did? I thought I kept it a secret. It was a test to see how many of you would come. So thank you for coming. Um, and I, I, I didn't have to know the numbers because I had to kind of figure out how many wines to get because these wines are not easy to get. Uh, trust my friend John to uh, write about rare, rarer wines. Anyway, welcome. My name is Liv Wu. I'm on the uh, uh, Mountain View food team. I was hired six years ago as an executive chef, but, but now I'm, I'm a program manager. And very happy that we have Kitchen Sink, the download on food. That's the official name of this glass cube. It's a, it's a mouthful, and it still doesn't tell you that it's a teaching kitchen, um, which is what it is. Um, the food team believes passionately in uh, not just giving you the fish, but teaching you how to fish. And so we have created this place, this lab, this studio, if you want, for you to play in and to learn as much as you want to about food, including that very essential ingredient, wine. And so um, we, we do uh, want to learn a lot about wine, and I am absolutely thrilled to have as my first guest uh, this expert and my dear friend John Bonet, uh, wine editor for the San Francisco Chronicle and my former colleague. Welcome. Great to be here. Thank you guys for coming. So um, John came to the Chronicle in 4006? 4006. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. And then I got in the time. <laughs> 2006. 2006. And then, and I left in 2008, uh, but was a, an amazing colleague. Uh, just the, the depth and the breadth of, of uh, knowledge about wine. Spoken sometimes in a lovely, geeky way. This is what I loved about him. Um, just uh, endeared himself to me. Um, I put myself at his feet and, and tried to learn about tasting wine. Wednesday mornings, 50 to 80, ta 80 wines that we poured and tasted. Um, and we spit uh, on Wednesday morning. <laughs> In two and a half hours. In two and a half hours. Um, to, to go through all the wines that come through the, the Chronicle uh, wine selection. So. Um, John was in Seattle before he came to San Francisco. He was with uh, MSNBC, uh, writing about lifestyles and wine. Um, he's also been published in, in the New York Times, in various food magazines and travel magazines. So um, he is, he's really knowledgeable. And we did uh, many a series of stories together that we loved doing, which was finding wines to pair with Asian flavors. And that was just a lot of fun. A lot of fun cooking and... and I'm still going to get you back for one more of <laughs> OK. <laughs> it's a deal. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Yeah. So, so, and the, um, we, I get to do something with him I've never done, which is we, we each interview a lot of people and did a lot of reporting, but I get to interview him now. So tell me what was the genesis of the book and um, why you decided to say yes, even though you had this label that kind of sat on top of you that said he hates California wine. <laughs> um, that, that was what, what was said about him, uh, and even though I knew it was not true. Um, the, the specific genesis of it was this, this piece I did for Suburb Magazine in 2010 called The New California Wine, which made it seem like it was a very smart thing to then turn into a book. Um, but I mean, you know probably better than almost anyone else what it was like for me when I came out here. Uh, I didn't inherently have anything against California wine, but I had grown up with wine from California and elsewhere uh, in, in New York uh, and um, had started writing about wine when I moved to the West Coast in Seattle. Uh, and had this amazing explosion to witness of Northwest wines that I absolutely fell in love with um, and would 
continually taste California because when you write about wine, you have to taste from all over. And was really persistently disappointed and wondered what had happened from this time when I was a kid and my father was teaching me about wine. And, um, and we would taste wines from Mandavi and whoever, and they were certainly very good. Um, and this was, at that point, sort of early 80s, I'd say. Um, and jumping forward 20 years or so, um, really why there was no real interest for me. And then, of course, I got hired by the San Francisco Chronicle to write about wine, um, notably California wine, which um, was a bold move on their part. Um, and what became clear, I mean, I started out looking for any signs of hope. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> And, and actually kept, kept finding them here and there. I mean, the, the first really significant one was not far from here was uh, I had to choose uh, the winemaker of the year two weeks after I got there um, and chose Paul Draper at Ridge. And so um, actually didn't even make the trek uh, to Cupertino because he was in London and had to spend three hours on the phone with him um, when he was in London after a slightly tipsy lunch um, <laughs> getting my winemaker interview done. Um, but. Um, found him, found Josh Jensen at Calera uh, down in uh, San Benito County the next year, who really had pioneered terroir-driven Pinot Noir in this country. Um, kept finding more and more people um, and, and realized especially the, uh, that there was this younger generation of winemakers who, um, who were at first, it seemed, just making kind of interesting side projects and working around the edges. And then by about 2010, it became really clear that what they were doing, and I don't even think they knew it particularly, was changing the dialogue about California wine and what it represented and how the world would perceive it. And that, that really, ultimately, what they were beginning to do, and I think have done, is as important culturally as what the great pioneers of the late 60s and the early 70s did here, the Robert Mondavis and the Warren Vinyarskis, which is to make wine from California they felt was as relevant uh, and is site specific and is driven by a sense of place as great wine from anywhere else in the world. There were the greats of the, the 70s and the judgment of Paris and then was there a real fall? What happened? Why, why did there, they go off There course? was a fall but not in the way people perceive it. Uh, necessarily. So the 80s were, were this transitional time. A lot of uh, wineries grew very fast and very big um, and started uh, making what they called at the time fighting varietals, which were, which were valuable. This, this is when, you know, when the notion of $10 Chardonnay or $8 Chardonnay really appeared for the first time, uh, or Merlot or Cabernet, that you would, rather than buying wine known by a place or by something like Mountain Chablis, which meant absolutely nothing, um, that you would buy a specific type of grape. Um, and you, typically, it was from California, and it wasn't more specific than that. And in part, that was because um, as they grew, they, you, know, you, you started making millions of cases. You had to go out to the Central Valley. You had to find cheaper and, and more kind of industrially farmed grapes uh, and find ways to, to, grow, to grow your business to make the numbers work. Um, so that was one piece. And then the other piece was uh, that um, in the really starting in the late 60s through the mid to late 80s, um, the advice that Davis, that UC Davis was giving to vineyardists was to plant their vineyards on a rootstock uh, called AXR1. Um, and the way, that, the way that vineyards work uh, really almost everywhere in the world is that um, every vine is essentially a mutant, it's a hybrid. Um, the, the, the vinifera vine, the, um, that specific um, genus, I think, um, is, um, is susceptible uh, to a number of things, but particularly to a vine last called phylloxera. Phylloxera destroyed most of the world's vineyards in the 19th century, destroyed them again in places in the 20th. Uh, and so it's always been this challenge to find a way to, um, to prevent this, this pest from eradicating huge, huge yeah. portions of vineyard. Um, so what, the, what you do is you take um, a resistant rootstock, you graft the vine on top, and almost every vine planted in the state of California is planted that way. And actually, almost every vine planted in France, Italy, Spain, pretty much everywhere in the world is planted that way. Right. Um, so AXR was this great solution to them. And it was, it was good for yield. It was good for productivity. It was drought tolerant. Um, 
It had a slight problem with phylloxera. It wasn't entirely resistant, but it, you, you go back and you look at the text and they actually say, you know, we think it's so good that the, the, the lack of resistance probably isn't going to be an issue. Um, so by the late 80s, almost, uh, I wouldn't say almost all, but an enormous portion of California's vineyards had been wiped out by phylloxera for, uh, at the time, over a billion dollars of replanting. Um, so after this huge boom, there was this uh, replanting that came. Uh, and at the same time, there was a ton of money that showed up. And this is going into the early 90s. And so, especially in Napa, there were these new vineyards, and new vineyards do one thing very well, which is to produce fruit very fast at very high sugar levels. Um, and you have an influx of, an influx of investors who um, were interested in wine, might not have known a lot about wine, but were curious and, and wanted to sort of get in there and get famous quick. Uh, and you had vineyards that would make these big, ripe, uh, very expressive wines, even if they weren't complex. Uh, and you also had critics who suddenly decided that rather than these much more structured, much more classic wines that uh, people had been interested in before, that the bigger the better. Uh, and this is what, what's in the book called um, the beginning of the era of big flavor, where there was no, there was no upper limit, is how I would put it. And so in a way, that was a mark of great success because all of a sudden there were these wines that had no tracker record that were coming out and getting 97, 98, 99, 100 points uh, from critics. Uh, and people were going a little crazy over them. They were big, they were flashy, um, they were increasingly very expensive. And so if you didn't know a lot about wine, but you knew that 99 was better than 95, um, and you were looking for a way to get sort of, to get a connoisseurship very quickly, um, these were wines that would do it without having to sort of go through the boring part of, you know, of learning about terroir and, and looking for wines that had a, a specific track record. And so um, it's hard to say that that was a, um, a decline because obviously in a way it was a success, but it also chased a lot of very serious people out of the industry. So, so give me a sense of uh, the wines that were scored 95, 96, 97, 99 by wine enthusiasts or by somebody else, we won't mention quite yet. Um, how were you scoring them? Um, luckily, at that point, I was, um, well, when that started, I was still in college, so I was not scoring <laughs> anything because I was drinking, you know, cheap Chilean wine, anything <laughs> out of a jug. Um, but um, when I got to the Chronicle and these wines would, at least some of them come before me, because really the ones who, who reached that truly top pinnacle, um, they would get into this, this thing where typically you would send a wine critic wine and they would review it, but, um, but they got to this place where they felt that the only way that a critic would properly understand it was if they came to the winery and they tasted it with the winemaker and tasted it in context and got to, therefore, get a complete sense of the wine. So if you wanted to go and taste, let's say, a Screaming Eagle uh, or a Harlan, you would make, a, make, you would make the trip, because you, otherwise you wouldn't get to taste the wine. And if you were a critic who was trafficking in such things, um, you would look like a chump uh, if you didn't have that in your roster. Um, how did I score them? Not very well. Uh, and that was part of it, is I got here with some notion of, of frustration about California and then was encountering a lot of these wines, not all of them, some of them were Momade, but a lot of these wines over and over again that were just monotonous. They tasted like raisins um, and, and oak and alcohol. They just, and, and the thing was that it was, and we'll talk more, I'm sure, about the details of this in a little bit, but um, it was people pushing grape growing beyond the bounds of, um, of sort of, of natural chemistry. Uh, and some of it was that there was a rise of technology in the 90s, uh, really, that allowed um, people to go far beyond the adjustments they had ever made to really kind of tweak wine to make it taste however they wanted. So rather than think about how you would take a grape grown to optimum ripeness, pick it, make wine from it, and hopefully it would express some semblance of where it was grown, you would just grow a grape as ripe as you could uh, knowing that the things that you were taking out of it, for instance, acidity, natural acidity, you could just put right back in. Um, and that one of the things, for instance, that, that happens when you do that, which is that um, wine is a slightly delicate microbial environment. Um, when, you, when you have a wine that's too low in acidity, it exposes itself to bacterial taint, potential bacterial taint. Um, but when you have 
all these filtration techniques that showed up, uh, reverse osmosis that showed up, um, something called Velcrin, which was originally used in sports drinks, which, um, which essentially neutralizes, biologically neutralizes uh, whatever it's put into. Um, then you don't have to worry about sort of the natural parameters of wine. Interesting. But then we can't place all the wine, all the blame on the wine, on the critics that scored high. I mean, there had to be an audience that loved big, in-your-face, jammy wines and, and high alcohol. Is that true? Is that part of the equation? There of were, absolutely. And, and, and in part, um, there was, whereas wine had always been portrayed before as something that was on the table, your point about it being integrated into the program here, it was on the table, it was part of a meal. Um, these wines were really intended and, and were largely consumed on their own. On their own. And so you, you didn't sort of, you didn't open up a blockbuster thinking you would have it with, you know, a Tuesday night dinner. You opened it up because you wanted to be impressed and you wanted your friends to be impressed and you would sort of sit in awe of this wine that simply um, kind of turned itself up to 11. Oh, one of the, my, the greatest lessons I learned from you was that low alcohol, lower alcohol red wines, which are very hard to find for especially Asian flavors, which are so bold, um, uh, are the wines that go well with food. Usually. Uh, usually. Usually. Right. Um, uh, anything above 13.5, 14 is going to fight with a, with a high flavored food. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and the thing is that if, if your life consists of going and eating rare filet mignon, <laughs> um, every night, then you might have a justification for a 15% Cabernet or 15% Vizin Vendel. Um, and, and they're really, I mean, legitimately, there are gastronomic contexts for those. Uh, but on balance, they just they don't work well with food, and 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 even I think their defenders have largely tried to have you know have, have sort of given up on trying to make the case that they're they're gastronomic wines. They they want to be showpieces. So you wrote the book based on the Saber articles, and then you you put this winemaker, this wine grower, on the cover. Tell tell us about uh, Mr. Limon. Yeah, so, so um, Ted Lemon uh, owns a winery called Litterai, uh, L-I-T-T-O-R-A-I, um, and he was my 2010 winemaker of the year. And Ted, Ted is really one of my favorite people in California. Um, he was, among other things, um, he was the first American to run a domain in Burgundy. He was like 24 years old. Wow. He'd studied uh, in Dijon, I think, um, Dijon or Bone. And um, Domaine Guy Rouleau, which is really the greatest, or one of the greatest houses in, in the commune of Merceau, uh, sort of one of the top white wines in Burgundy. Um, their patriarch had died. They needed someone to come in and, and make the wines. And Ted was highly recommended. It's, you know, it was implied that he wasn't going to, um, despite the fact he was an American, he wasn't going to muck around with things too much and would more or less keep the winemaking style as it was. And so that was his, his real tutelage. So he came back to the US, came to California. Um, and you would think, well, he made wine in Burgundy, he's going to try to make wines like Burgundy. Um, and very quickly he concluded that it was ludicrous to try and do that, and that what he should do was to take the best of the lessons that he had learned about respecting soils, which, and he, he says it in the book, Burgundy did not often do very well, um, despite having really some of the great terroirs in the world. Um, but learning how to respect the soils, learning how to farm well, and really learning how to make wines that are appropriate to their place. Uh, and began what's now, I guess, been about a 20-year um, endeavor to find these great vineyards. Um, literai means, in Latin, it's a derivative of, of the coasts. And so uh, running essentially from approximately Sebastopol uh, up through Anderson Valley, um, this, this winery that's essentially a meditation on great, great vineyard sites near the Pacific coast. Um, which would in and of itself be interesting, but Ted also is one of the most diligent farmers I have ever met. Um, he uh, practices biodynamics, uh, which is sort of organics beyond, um, but not even Steinerian biodynamics, although he would argue it's classical Steinerian biodynamics, um, but he's kind of pushed aside the, you know, the, the, the by the numbers uh, version of biodynamics and really started working with consultants who, would, um, who looked at, um, at agroecology and looked at um, farming uh, your farm as a holistic unit. 
um, which involves figuring out appropriate cover crops, which involves growing, not only using homeopathic treatments, but growing the chamomile uh, or the nettles yourself. Um, and really, in his case, um, his Does he have is, animals on the farm running around? He has some animals. The okay. animals are always a little tricky, um, <laughs> especially when you have grapevines. Um, but um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's this sort of, it's this negotiation of manure. I mean, he's, I, I, as I said, you have never met someone who has been so revered in, in the world and who, you know, who graduated Brown and, you know, um, has this sort of Ivy League education who spends so much time thinking about cow manure. Um, <laughs> and his thing is that it's, it's not even the grapes. Um, you know, he has a lot of work with vines and with using clonal, uh, clonal replication so that instead of going to the nursery and getting what they say you should get, that you really are interested in coming up with a clonal diversity or, in his case, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, but more than that, that you have to figure out a way to sustainably farm the dirt so that you have, uh, you have a, a biological life in your vineyard and that will allow you to create wines of true distinction. So Ted sort of ended up embodying all of the things that the book gets into because a lot of it is about farming and how the real goal of farming in wine is to be able to create, to create these, these signatures of place that make a wine different from another wine. Um, that let you see the, this, this sort of vague notion of terroir, lets you understand what potentially is there. Um, and he sort of, he, he completes the loop, plus he did his best American Gothic impression for us. And, um, so after 13 covers, it became clear this was the, the image we really wanted. They're all, well, they're not all. Um, quite a few are small wineries and probably not so easy to, to get wines. Are there, uh, producers and growers in here that, that are bigger and that are more accessible for us? Sure. Um, they, they vary. There are a fair number of small uh, wineries, only in that, as with any innovation, you're going to inevitably be looking for people who are starting to work at small scale. Right. Um, but, um, but, you know, but, but a lot of them have scaled. I mean, Ridge is a perfect example yeah. uh, of a wine that is still very accessible. Um, Calera actually as well, I mean, um, Calera, uh, the, cent the, the, the estate bottlings are not that easy to get, but the Central Coast, which are, um, with purchase fruit are, I mean, I think I see them in most Safeways. Um, this is Calera in Hollister. In uh, Hollister, yeah, right. or okay. 12, 12 miles outside of Hollister. Okay. Um, and um, who else? There's, um, there's a, a, a family that I, I profile in the book um, called the Bilbros, and they have a label called Marietta. Um, and Marietta, it's interesting, is about 35 or 37 years old now, and it's now up to 75,000 cases uh, of a wine called Old Vine Red. Uh, and it's, oh, it's really, that. yeah, it's, it's this kind of classic tribute to the old uh, field blends, really, that the, the, the Sonoma Italian farmers were making pre-prohibition. And they simply wanted to bring that back, in some cases, using the exact same vineyards, um, and to make purely uh, a table wine. Um, and then, because there's a whole chapter about table wine in this very issue of how do you how do you scale? Um, there's two brothers, just for one more, who um, Jim Jim and Bob Varner, who are twin brothers, who um, they um, did a number of things. One of them studied um, uh, uh, biotech. One of them uh, studied at Davis, um, doing sensory science. Um, but they found um, this tiny little jewel of a vineyard in Portola Valley, um, and really? make yeah, and uh, right by the open space, and make and have for almost well, certainly over thirty years now, um, really some of the best Chardonnays in California. But because they kind of came up in the late seventies, early eighties, at a time when they realized that even the great French winemakers also made table wine. Um, so they also, they, they went sort of farther south on the Central Coast to look for less expensive fruit. And they make a second label called Fox Club that is about $14 a bottle, $13, $14 a bottle. And they make, all told with the different ones, probably about 45,000 cases of it. Um, and in a slightly different way, it's not as, as meticulous. Um, but, but in a notion that you, as a good winemaker, have a responsibility to make a wine that people can actually find and that they can afford. Um, I'm going to have you talk about the wines we're going to be tasting uh, soon, and w we'll tell you where they are. But uh, I'm, I'll just break off for now, for the time being, and see if there are any questions. 
How do you envision this book being consumed by your readers? Um, that is not surprisingly a discussion that I had with my publisher. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think that we, we wanted it very much to be uh, a book that had multiple entry points. Um, it's funny, a lot of people do describe it as a coffee table book. I don't think it is, but um, uh, I think because it has some pretty pictures, maybe that's <laughs> where people take it to. Certainly you can put it on a coffee table. I, I have one on mine for um, not particularly aesthetic reasons. Uh, um, but it's, I mean, you know, it obviously needed to speak to people who are expert in the field um, and to be a solid reference. Uh, but I also wanted it to tell um, a specific narrative story. Uh, and so the first third of the book uh, is thematic in the sense that, I mean, some of it is talking about what we were just talking about, what happened, what went wrong, sort of what happened, you know, the evolution of history. Um, a lot of talk about farming, a lot of talk about um, uh, grapes and varieties and, and this totally arbitrary selection of the varieties that people associate with California, uh, when in fact there's many, many other grapes that do do well here and could do well. Um, and so it's not, you know, it's it's complex stuff, but I don't think it's, it's meant, I mean, it's not a textbook, it's not meant to be super, super nerdy. Um, and the other piece, so there's that, the second part is uh, what we ended up calling a road trip, which is looking at um, kind of the, the evolving geography of California um, through literally me going out and spending time and driving around a lot. Um, and then the third part is reference, and that is the part where I think people can go back and, you know, look for producers they might know, look for producers they don't know, and, and use it in some ways, in some ways as a buying guide. It, it's a, uh, the maps are great. Yes, and, 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 there's, it, and there's maps. <laughs> and it, it's so very different than the tourism yeah. map you would get when you drop into the Napa Valley or the Sonoma Valley or the Central Coast or Mendocino. And a complete shameless plug, I will say, um, those maps were almost entirely developed, all the data. Google. Google Earth. Oh, thank you. Google Maps. OK. <laughs> if you had said anything else. No, Google okay. Earth. Yeah. All right. um, I, no, and it was it, you know, shipped off the data set and uh, you know, then had to spend a lot of time negotiating with our cartographer. So anecdotally, I feel like in the last 10 years, wine prices in California have gone up quite tremendously. And the number of producers has also increased dramatically, uh, particularly small producers. Do you feel like we're in a wine bubble, per se? Uh, you think as the, people... the, the supply and demand curves don't quite seem to make sense? Um, yeah, I mean, some of it is that wine prices almost never go down. Um, they do when there's a major correction. And 2008 brought a major correction, but even then, um, you could see the pain that sort of the cult Cabernet makers had um, with having to contemplate what it would do to their brand to drop prices. And, it's, and a few of them did. I'm thinking of Dominus, which dropped its price by about $40 and then promptly raised it by $80. Um, but um, it's just, it is, the, it is probably the biggest problem with California wine, which is that um, it is very expensive to farm here. Um, there's built-in labor costs, there's obviously built-in land costs. Um, it's, if you buy new land, it is exorbitantly expensive to first buy it and then, and then plant it. Um, and also, there's, um, there's very little discussion within the industry of affordability. And that, to me, is as much a lot, it's really one of the big liabilities for California because um, I think everyone can make an ambitious wine uh, and wants to make an ambitious wine, but making uh, an affordable wine and a, a, what I would say is a sustainable business model is, is something people are struggling with. And um, I, I don't know that the number of wineries will, sh will shrink. I keep sort of waiting for it to because um, it's amazing how tolerant people's bankers are uh, of a really poor cash flow. Um, and I don't know that we need this constant expansion, only in that um, I would rather see quality come up. Uh, does the book only cover Napa or the whole California? It covers uh, all of California from, did I make it up to Humboldt? Um, let's say northern Mendocino um, down to San Diego County. Okay. Uh, and we actually did, we have two San Diego producers in there, um, and then also um, out into the Sierra foothills. Uh, have you been to many of those small family-owned boutique wineries? Quite a lot of them. So they all covered in the book? Or? Sorry? Uh, have you also featured them in the book? Yeah, I mean, um, there's, there's 125 producers who are in the book. Um, I, I would say they're all ultimately family-owned in some way. 
uh, and most of them are, you know, probably 80 to 85 percent of them are making 5,000 cases or less. Thank you. Hi. Um, so you mentioned um, things about like additives and what they were putting back in the wine, and um, so like what, if anything, is like the role of modern chemistry and science in New California wine? So. Ridge is actually a good example because um, Ridge had a guy named Leo McCloskey who has become the poster child for what I will call interventionism uh, in the cellar. Um, he worked there as, a, as an intern actually in the 70s uh, before he went on to become a pretty famous wine consultant. Um, he's the guy who has, um, he created a software based around um, uh, uh, gas chromatography um, that he asserts can predict um, to the exact number what Robert Parker and the Wine Spectator will give a wine. Um, I hate to think of being that predictable as a, as a critic, but um, so it is. So one of the things that that created at Ridge was a legacy where um, the lab serves as your, your canary, so to speak. Um, it shows you when things are going right. It shows you if there's really um, a microbial issue, a chemical issue that um, needs to be dealt with. Um, it gives you a constant set of feedback. Um, but then the other side of Ridge is this very, I don't want to say rudimentary, but this very minimalist view of winemaking where they, they really do believe that in general um, that the you know, properly farmed grapes um, can go through spontaneous fermentations, um, that the very yeast strains that you need to take a wine all the way through um, should fundamentally uh, be available to you. Um, that's not a universal, but it's certainly, um, it's certainly uh, I think, a good, um, a good belief to have rather than believing you have to sort of you know, inevitably start out with a commercial yeast. Um, they try not to do uh, acid adjustments. Um, they do a little bit, they do add a little bit of water. A lot of people add water, which is technically illegal, but um, is um, just, it's um, a very weak acidification. <laughs> um, you know, there's, it's interesting, because I think there are people who believe that you cannot do, you absolutely can't do anything. Um, and that is difficult because there are just times when things don't go right, um, even for people who would choose to not do more than an absolute bare minimum. Um, but the thing to always remember is that each step that someone takes beyond, um, beyond really sort of 19th century winemaking inevitably pulls the wine away, and especially when you're starting to adjust chemistry, pulls the wine away from what it would taste like if it were grown to peak ripeness, where where it was grown and pulled off, kind of at this this balance point, and it's you know it's not something to even pick on California uh, about necessarily because the French have been adding sugar to their wines and still do um, for 150 years uh, in order to bring up the uh, the minimum alcohol levels. Um, so they have some uh, issues to deal with as as to a lot of New World uh, regions. Um, but I think the thing for me that I always try to remember is where we are with viticulture now, with grape growing, is so exponentially farther than we were 30 years ago um, that things are not always going to go right, but there is a lot more knowledge in figuring out how to hit peak ripeness naturally um, so that people who are deliberately pushing beyond that because they feel that, um, that that's how they, they'd rather construct their wine, um, that to me is a problem because it's also those folks who usually want about 150 to $200 a bottle. The raisin wines. The raisin wines. And, and, and one of the things that, that, that I assert, that we, this is something that came up uh, first time I think last year when we were in Charleston is, um, you know, a lot of, I mean, not just the book, but a lot of California wines are expensive. Um, and certainly when you're starting to pay 45, 50, 80, 100, $200 a bottle for a product, um, I want someone who have done their job right. And when, uh, when people are either correcting things they did wrong or deliberately making uh, bad decisions about farming so that they can go and fix it later, um, then I'm paying someone to have, uh, to have essentially done their job badly. This, this might be rather obvious, but as a wine critic, what do you see as your role? <laughs> good, good, good question. Uh, that is a good question. Um, I think my role is to, to do what any critic does, which is to find, to find what there is of quality 
um, and highlight it, um, to find what is uh, underperforming and take issue with it. Um, I don't get to do quite as much of that as I would like to, um, <laughs> but uh, commercial realities of newspapers. Um, but I think more than anything, to be able to step back and talk about um, themes and trends and what's happening and where things are going, and to see where uh, to see where the edge is and to see where the avant-garde is, and not to simply um, sort of hand out scores, um, because I, I think wine, for whatever reason, has fallen into this place where um, people expect that a critic's job is to just sort of you know hold up a number at the end of things, um, and that's given birth to a lot of critics who I think don't step back and look, uh, look for greater perspective um, and, and look at whether um, a style of wine or styles of wine or, or regions are um, emerging and getting interesting or perhaps are, uh, are, um, you know, are living a little too high on the hog or are uh, overextending themselves. And so um, I think my view of, of how you're uh, of being a wine critic is probably a little more aggressive than, um, than some uh, some of my fellow critics. Um, but the other thing, and I think it's important and I've been talking about it more, is that um, there's this somewhat flawed notion uh, in wine criticism and, and food criticism as well that, um, that you can stand back and be objective and that you can provide a, you can, you can hand down from on high the score that will absolutely represent the quality of wine, of a restaurant, what have you, which is ludicrous. Um, you know, in my case, I can bring my experience uh, I can bring what, what I see are um, successful iterations uh, of, uh, of, of a wine or of a region. Um, but ultimately, I, 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 I came to this, this realization that I had to own my biases. Uh, and I would sort of hope that uh, in the next few years that I see more wine critics doing the same because um, there are a handful of folks who I'm thinking of who, um, who very clearly have biases, which is fine. Um, they've done very well by them, but they do sort of stand behind this veil of objectivity um, and pretend as though uh, what they're doing is, uh, is gospel. And, and that I have a huge problem with. That leads me to a question. Um, so, so food critics, um, we're all being undone by Yelpers and, and others. Is that, it's not happening as heavily in wine, is it? It's happening a fair amount. Yeah. Um, n not that there was ever a great sustainable career as a wine. You know, I, I, uh, I mean, uh, basically, well, there's you, you know, well. I, I have one of the two unicorn jobs in the country, and Eric Asimov at the time says the other, and so um, we, you know, we enjoy our our our, um, uh, our good luck. Um, but I, I think going forward, what's going to and to, and to the point about what a critic's role is, um, what's going to be, what's going to happen, and probably in food as well, is that you know anyone can hand out four stars and say that the fries were soggy, um, but but to actually Two come, stars. sorry, four stars on Yelp. <laughs> <laughs> um, to actually step back and to look at themes and patterns and to see what's happening and to be able to place restaurants but also um, chefs, trends, cities into context um, is still something that really does require professional skill. Um, and, and honestly, a lot of writers don't have that skill. Um, so, I mean, the way I just started describing it with wine is that I think where we're going to evolve to is something a little bit more like a pro am. Uh, model where you know there's no reason not to have um, not to have input from people who are tasting the wines um, because I, I, I don't know if anyone's encountered um, there's a website called Cellar Tracker which it's um, its technical issues aside um, is actually a very very good database of consumer and pro reviews of mm. wines um, and it's astonishing to me how often the um, the 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 median of the consumer reviews comes to um, to where professional reviews land. So my takeaway from that is that when you get people who are interested in the wines and who are interested enough to actually want to go um, and share their views of them, you get a pretty accurate view of quality. Um, and there's no reason not to have that and not to appreciate that. Same thing, there's a um, technology called Delectable that's doing something similar, um, although it's all iPhone-based. I've nagged them incessantly that um, they said they had trouble finding an Android developer. I'm gonna, um, 
but um, but same thing. It's 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 a way that you can sort of it's sort of Facebook for wine, basically. It, it lets you kind of see what um, what everyone you know is drinking. And the great thing with it is that it has optical recognition. So all you have to do is take a picture of the bottle, and within ten or fifteen minutes, it will tell you with about ninety nine percent accuracy what you're drinking. Um, so. Um, so there's these models that are out there that I think are very effective for doing a lot of what criticism has done in the past, which is just throw numbers out on something, um, which for me gives me the latitude to go and do things like write books. Uh, what if there's no water in California? That's a really good question. Um, water gets a good bit of discussion in the book. Um, the thing with grapevines that, that most winemakers don't want to admit is that they're basically weeds. They're not really hard to grow. I mean, when you, when you look at crops that are actually difficult to grow, vines are extraordinarily easy to grow. And they actually don't require a lot of water. They're a, they're, they're a, they're a drought tolerant crop when they're farmed correctly. Um, the problem is that mostly after the advent of drip irrigation, um, which was better admittedly than furrow and, and, and sprinkle, uh, ir uh, sprinkler irrigation, um, viticulturists in California came to believe that they had to water their vines in a very regular pattern. Um, so the first thing is you see um, vineyards that have been established as dry farmed um, tend to be much more drought tolerant because um, they've just they've developed deeper root systems. Um, there's not as much variability based on seasonal weather patterns and rainfall. Um, but also there's there's a company that I talk about in the book called Fruition Sciences, and these are guys who came up with a very good um, model of using various sensor probes. Um, to, to measure sort of the potential water access of vineyards. Um, and their assertion is that even, um, even vineyards that are uh, using relatively water could probably drop their water usage by 80 to 90% and still farm well. Wow. Um, so I think that um, the folks who are either deciding that um, they're going to take the time to let vineyards establish themselves without added water, um, or the folks who are really willing to, to use the technology that's available to them um, to drop their water use, they're going to be fine. Um, the folks who want to keep using standard drip so that they can bump their yields up and they can keep essentially overcharging people for wine, um, they're going to face a rather significant crisis if this keeps going. There's a current trend right now about like pairing um, Cabernet Francs with Sichuan cuisine. I just want to know what your opinion is on that. I love it. <laughs> I did. Yeah, I, I've taken. Um, I well, you know, old Mandarin. Um, there, there's a, there's a. It's not specifically even such one. It's more Beijing style. But um, there's a uh, restaurant in the Outer Sunset near me that um, that uses a fair amount of those flavors, and I bring some form of Cabernet based Franc wine. Cabernet Franc based wine everywhere I can, or every time I can. Um, some of it is that it is one of the few wines that has both the aromatics and also what I'll say sort of the, the capsicum-like uh, aspects in its aromas, um, as well as this very bright fruit um, that actually goes with, um, with, uh, with sort of the range of, of Sichuan flavors. So um, yeah, it's, um, you've just revealed my secret. <laughs> it's, in, it's in print somewhere, I yeah. think, actually. So um, if, if you have no more questions, I'm going to have you describe the four wines, the, th uh, the three wines that we have for tasting. Sure. And then uh, we'll pour some wine. And uh, you can ask John more questions while you're sipping. So talk about the Chenin Blanc first. Yes. In he it'll be in here. Is it in there? Yes. The Chenin Blanc. Um, so um, we actually have two, two wines from uh, the same winemaker um, and then um, one from uh, another um, uh, duo of guys. Uh, so the Chenin Blanc is the Leo Steen Chenin Blanc. Uh, it's made by a guy named Leo Hansen, who's actually Danish, um, was a sommelier, a very famous sommelier in Copenhagen, and uh, wanted to make wine, so he came to California, um, makes wine actually for a vineyard in Sonoma called Stolmuller, um, but also has his own label called Leo Steen. Steen is his middle name. Steen is also the South African name, the historical South African name for Chenin Blanc, which is the other place in the world that it grows well. Um, and uh, so this is from, um, this is his Chenin Blanc. It's from Dry Creek Valley from uh, a vineyard called Saini, S-A-I-N-I, -I, about 30-year-old vines, dry farmed. Um, and uh, in fact, I think all of the vines, all the wines today are from dry farmed vineyards. Uh, in fact, from dry farmed organic vineyards. Um, so about 30 years old, um, kind of a parcel that the farmer, you know, forgot or was selling off because Chenin Blanc is, 
Um, used to be a very significant grape in California in the 70s and 80s, and then got this reputation for being kind of um, trashy and not that interesting, and um, uh, and people stopped drinking it. And so um, uh, Leo and a handful of other folks have started to bring it back. Really, is this great sort of aromatic, um, slightly spicy uh, table wine uh, that is great. And um, I, I don't tend to age this wine very long, but um, I have. I have friends who do um, who do age it and, and insist, among other things, that like the 2006 bottling of this is one of the best Chenin Blancs they've had. And this is someone, by the way, who makes what I would argue is the best Chenin Blanc in California. So if he thinks Leo is beating him, I'll give him that. Um, and it's uh, 16, 17 dollars. How much? How much is it? that? 17. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, directly behind you, um, and I'm going sort of in, in the order that I would probably taste them. Um, is the, there we go, uh, the Barrichino, uh 2012 Sanso. Um, this is, so Birakino is a project from two guys, John Locke uh, and Alex Krauss. Um, both of them worked for Randall Graham at Bonnie Dune and survived. Um, and John actually um, still uh, runs a wine shop in Santa Cruz called Swap. Um, but uh, so they make wine together under this label, um, and this is from um, one of my favorite vineyards in the state. It's from a vineyard called Bechtold, um, which is in western Lodi, uh, and it's uh, it was planted in 1886. Um, to Sanso, which is sort of a not terribly noteworthy grape from southern France, um, and somehow Bechtold has become the darling of all California. Um, everyone wants to get into Bechtold and make Sanso. Um, Turley uh, actually was sort of the first big name to get in there and make this very mm -hmm. Beaujolais style. Um, they now are in there. Uh, Randall used to use it for um, for uh, cigar ballant, um, and a handful of other folks, Scolium Project, etc. Um, like I said, it's it's um, it's sort of organically farmed by neglect. Nobody ever bothered <laughs> to put chemicals on it. So, um, and 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 again, sort of sandy soils, dry farmed, um, and it's this completely improbable vineyard. No one's entirely sure how it survived, because nobody made any money in Lodi selling grapes, and certainly not Sanso from low yielding grapes, uh, from low yielding, you know, dry farmed vines um, that were getting I don't know four hundred dollars a ton and are now getting like maybe three times that. Um, so it's to me this is this quintessence one of really the the longevity of California and how um, for all of the newness there really is a, a great lineage back to the past um, and to these grapes that um, were once really important here before um, sort of market forces dictated that Cabernet and Chardonnay would take over um, uh, and it's it's just you know it's pretty it's fragrant um, it is. To, to your point before, it is a wine that I think would go with quite a lot of food um, because it's it's subtle. The tannins are very uh, very soft. It's just it's not a tannic grape, um, and I think more than anything, it, it preserves this um, this really significant vineyard that um, that is very much um, a historical artifact. Um, on similar lines, kind of right around the corner, um, back to to Leo, um, is the here we go. Um, the Leo Steen Calpella, uh, and this is, uh, unfortunately, I think he's going to move on to a different vineyard, but, um, so he also wanted to make a red wine. Um, oh, and the, the, the Bechtold is, I think, $19, 19 or 20 um, And so uh, the Leo Steen Calpella um, is a blend uh, going back again to important, historically important grapes in California. It's a blend of Carignan and Petit Syrah uh, from... Uh, vineyard's about, I think, 60, 65 years old. It's called the Testa Vineyard. It's in Calpella, uh, which is a tiny little hamlet in Mendocino right off the 101. Um, and again, this is one of those vineyards that just survived by neglect. It's dry farmed, organically farmed. Um, again, just old Mendocino farming family didn't really know what to do with it, but didn't want to take it out. And so they've now found buyers uh, who are interested in paying them fair market value. Um, so Carignan was the great workhorse grape of the, the late 19th and early 20th century, um, planted all over, a very big part of the old field blends. Um, can make an interesting wine when it's from old vines, which this is. Um, got, again, a reputation for being sort of lowly and uninteresting, which it can be if it's not farmed well. Um, 
but um, makes this very savory, spicy, um, uh, complex wine. There's usually kind of a celery seed component to it. Um, Petit Syrah being the other sort of piece of the blending component historically, um, used for color, used for tannin, very sort of very tannic, very kind of blue. It's like um, like blueberries and sandpaper. Um, and it's, um, it's, not, it's not a huge component in here. Um, I think it's sort of, this is a very appropriate use of it. Um, but again, this, this notion, this is obviously more structured, but if you think about what a really good kind of somewhat savory table wine should be, um, I think this is, um, this is a perfect, perfect example. And again, it's 18, 18 bucks maybe. Yeah. Great, so look forward to tasting it. Thank you so much. Thank and you.